Hello again. Welcome to the second part of my series, wondering together what ancient Christians might have to say to us today regarding our worship. This is based on writings that we have from people who have gone long before us. The person we're going to look at today is a woman named Egeria. Um, that's E-G-E-R-I-A, for those of you who like to hear the spelling as well as see it. And we don't know very much about this woman, but she was a nun. She may have been French or from Gaul or from Spain. She lived probably somewhere on the Atlantic coast. And she traveled to the holy city about 50 years after the reign of Constantine was over. And she wrote a book accounting her travels so that she could share it with her sisters when she got home. This is a delightful book to read. I would recommend it to you um, because she writes with so much enthusiasm and glee as she experiences Christians in other parts of the world. You might say that she's a kind of a church tourist or a, a worship geek as she's very interested in uh, differences that these worshiping congregations have from what she's used to. This book, just like the Didache, in a way was uh, lost for a long time, 700 years in this particular case, and was only found quite recently. Uh, we date this book back to about 381 or 384 AD, and um, the book is written in Latin and translated. It's really cool because she's so interested in the local flavor of the churches and, and the people where she is. So I wanted to just speak briefly on two of the things she focuses on and then wonder together what Egeria might say if she were with us today and how she would instruct us in how our worship practices might be enhanced or renewed through what we can learn from her. First, she spends quite a bit of time explaining the catechumenate instruction. These are people who are preparing to be baptized on Easter. And she explains that first, on the second day of Lent, the group of people who are to be baptized are brought with their fathers and mothers before the bishop. Now, we might ascertain that father or mother here probably means more of a spiritual father or mother than an actual biological parent. But they're brought with their witnesses before the bishop and asked about uh, their conduct. They're vetted in a way. Is this person leading a good life? Does he respect his parents? Is she a drunkard or a boaster? And if it's agreed that they have pretty good conduct. Um, they, or their names are written down, and if not, they're dismissed, hopefully, in prayer, that they will um, be able to turn from their ways. Then, after that, there is uh, an exorcism. And Egeria doesn't write very much about this. She's actually quite surprised that the exorcism happens when it does, although to our contemporary ears, we're surprised that it happens at all. We don't really know what this exorcism might look like. Uh, it might not look like what we see in movies. It might look more simply like the renunciation of Satan and of the powers of evil in our world. And then, as she continues to explain what happens to the catechumenates, during the 40 days of Lent, the folks who are baptized are taught by the bishop. And this is not simply a three-class series. This is a series of three-hour teaching from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., every single day. The people are taught the entire Bible, beginning with Genesis, for the first uh, five weeks, and then they are taught the creeds. There's a lot of education that goes on in preparation to be welcomed and baptized and part of the church. The second thing I wanted to focus on that Adria talks about is she is very clear to describe the enthusiasm of the learners. Let me read this part for you. At ordinary services, when the bishop sits and preaches, ladies and sisters, the faithful utter exclamations. But when they come and hear him explaining the catechesis, their exclamations are far louder. God is my witness, and when it is related and interpreted like this, they ask questions on each point. So she, her enthusiasm is multiplied by the enthusiasm of the learners. So this is not some dry, um, boring, checkbox to complete. This is a wonderful time of spiritual growth, mental encouragement, and 
preparation for baptism. So if I were interviewing Edgeria right now, if she were sitting next to me and I said, so what can we learn from this? She might encourage those of us who in our congregations, we, we don't have a process for catechumens, for people who are going to be baptized or some in some cases confirmed or become members of the church to develop a process. And I know you might think, well, what does this have to do with worship? But it has a lot to do with worship because our own wor actions in worship are very much informed by what we know and how we understand the Christian story and the, the stories and creeds that have gone before us. Also, their learning is not just something small. It is a huge time commitment. Um, I did the math, so if, if they have this six days a week, it would be 126 hours of preparation. If they did it seven days a week, it would be 147 hours. So somewhere in here is the ideal number of hours the catechumens have spent preparing, and it's a lot. This is something we can definitely learn from. It's a graduate course in Christianity, almost, to prepare for baptism. Another thing that we might learn from this is the enthusiasm, both that she notices and that she practices in her own writing. Sometimes, especially for those of us who have been raised in the church, we really forget the, the deep meaning of the good news of Jesus. We forget the opportunity for enthusiasm that the story of God invites us into. Now, this might be partly cultural. For those of us from a Northern European stock, we might be a little bit more stoic and reserved in our emotion. However, what I love about her account is that we see both emotion and learning together so that it is not only our heart that is responding to God, it is also our mind. We are learning to love our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And this influences how we respond in worship. So I, I hope you found this insightful and helpful on your own journey in worship. If not, forgive me for wasting your time. May God bless you and be with you and continue to speak into your life through people who live now and through people who have gone before us.